Uh, well, hello and welcome to today's Creative Commons Open Culture Live webinar. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Maximizing the Values of Open Access and Cultural Heritage Institutions. Uh, my name is Brigitte Vizna and I'm the Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. And I'm really pleased to introduce this webinar. Uh, it'll be moderated by Connor Benedict, who's CC's Open Culture Coordinator. Um, I also want to acknowledge Jocelyn Miara, who's CC's Open Culture Manager, who's done really fantastic work in the lead up to this event. And together we work at Creative Commons to promote open culture and better sharing of cultural heritage. Now, this is the fourth webinar that we're organizing in our Open Culture Live series. And um, the aim of this series is really to address the key issues that arise in the field of open culture. Uh, all these webinars are recorded. They're all available from our Open Culture Resources page, and you can also find them directly on our YouTube channel. Um, today, so we'll tackle some of the more economic dimensions of open culture. And um, going back to our barriers report from 2022 um, entitled, the, what are the barriers to open culture? We found out that one of the major hurdles that cultural heritage institutions often face in opening up their collections is related to money. And this manifests in two key ways. One is the really hefty financial investment that's necessary to digitize and to maintain an open collection online. And another is the fear of a loss of revenue from licensing the collection out to users. So now this clearly warrants further examination. Um, is this fear founded? Is there a real risk of losing a significant revenue stream? Um, and if paid licensing is maintained, is the cost of a licensing mechanism really offset by any revenue that it might generate? So in other words, what are the real financial or commercial or economic impacts of open access for cultural heritage institutions? And even looking beyond those traditional licensing models, are there more creative ways to share open collections that don't compromise the institution's financial sustainability? And what are some of the new opportunities for revenue generation that actually go hand in hand with the open ethos? And how can institutions develop an economic model that enables them to offer the services uh, that uh, are aimed at sparking creativity, at cultivating a deep connection with heritage, uh, expanding meaningful learning opportunities in the spirit of their public interest mission. And also as a nod to the webinar's title, what are the key values at play here? And how might these values guide cultural heritage institutions towards solutions that will yield not only a healthy balance sheet, but also social and cultural benefits, as well as planetary well-being? So to help answer these questions, we've invited Douglas McCarthy, Chris Erickson, Giovanna Fontanelle, and Elliot Bledsoe, who will be introduced in a short moment. Thank you so much for being here with us today. So I'll pass over to you, Connor, to introduce our panelists and to get the conversation started. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brigitte. So um, as Brigitte mentioned, my name is Connor Benedict. I'm the Open Culture Coordinator at Creative Commons, and I am very excited to be moderating this discussion today. Um, I will give a brief introduction to each of our panelists and then also give them some time to introduce themselves and a bit of the work that they do. Um, then following that, uh, I'll have a few questions to guide the start of our conversation, but hopefully this uh, unfolds a bit organically and we see kind of where things go and where um, there's more to talk about. Uh, feel free to add questions in the chat throughout the conversation um, if you have them. My colleagues Brigitte and Justin will be happy to answer some ongoing, uh, but also towards the end we'll leave some time for questions directly to the panelists. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Chris Erickson, who is a professor of social data science and the deputy director of CREATE at the University of Glasgow. His research in the CREATE Center considers the link between innovation, creativity, and intellectual property. He is particularly interested in open licensing and the economic value of volunteer collective projects. He will briefly share a few of those findings today. Chris. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Connor. It's great to see some of you again and to meet all you new, new folks. So yeah, as Connor said, I'm a researcher uh, with a real interest in 
uh, these issues that Brigitte raised. Um, and in particular, I've been interested in the last five or 10 years in this puzzle, which is what happens when innovators and creative firms um, make use of inputs which come to them for free, right? In the sense that they're not protected by copyright law. Um, and what, if, if any, is the value um, that we could assign to these free inputs to this follow-on creative process? And one of the reasons why I'm interested in this is because it runs counter to the traditional story of copyright that, you know, uh, strong copyright protection fuels the creative industries and, you know, we get these great incentives and outputs. But when you look around and you dig under the surface, you find some arrangements which are quite different from that traditional story. Um, so I'll just briefly um, describe two research projects that might be relevant to our conversation today. One is qualitative and the other one is quantitative. So on the qualitative side, I've done uh, case study research with firms who have, uh, you know, made use of open and free materials, which they can obtain from, you know, different locations. Um, some of these are available in free and open repositories like Wikimedia Commons, others maybe from cultural heritage institutions, digital collections. Um, and what we find there is that firms are making use of these materials because um, often they offer a rapid road to market. So they help creative firms like prototype a content delivery platform or a new technology or an interesting new you know, visualization system. Um, so they, they use it as a placeholder maybe to start with, and then they go on to like, you know, commercialize products on the, on the basis of that. Um, but one really fascinating thing that we found from, from our research with, with um, creative firms uh, working in that mode is a lot of them get really into openness. And um, so they're often induced to give back to the community or the institution from which they're borrowing the material. Say, hey, we developed this. Do you want to use it? Or in some cases, give back the data set with improvements to the metadata and, and, and such like. And they also are more likely to open their innovations and products to downstream users and audiences in ways which is really different from sort of your traditional media firm. So that behavior is fascinating to us. And, you know, it seems kind of like um, there's this openness ecosystem, which actually once firms become aware of how it operates, they find lots of benefits in being a part of that, that sort of open sharing um, culture. And then the second uh, research is uh, quantitative. And here, what we've done is uh, looked at uh, a source of open licensed material. In this case, we looked at the Wikimedia Commons, which is a repository of uh, over now over 100 million open licensed uh, files. And we checked to see how those files are being used off of Wikimedia Commons, like who's using it downstream, who's making use of those materials, which many of which are licensed um, under Creative Commons. Um, and one super interesting thing well, first of all, we found a lot of use. Um, we found an average or mean usage of 5.5 uh, offsite uses per file. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing is that the human curatorial, let's say, effort, which goes into Wikimedia Commons, because it's not all automated, human beings rate and assign metadata to images. When images are tagged with like a quality or featured human uh, curatorial review, that really amplifies their likelihood of discovery and reuse off site by commercial and non commercial uh, users alike. And what we tried to do was extrapolating from our sample of 10,000 uh, images, which we which we studied, extrapolating out to the whole commons, uh, which at that time constituted about 50 million files, half the size that it is now, um, and assigning a equivalent commercial license rate. So if you tried to license that similar image from Getty or one of the other uh, stock image libraries, how much would it cost? We find a total, let's say, equivalent economic value to all the downstream uses of about 22 and a half billion US dollars, um, just from digital use of the um, you know, open license material, which is, on, which is on Wikimedia Commons at a time when it was half as, as big as it is now. So that's all just to say that you know, there's a tremendous amount of value in free and open license materials, both from cultural heritage institutions and from other, let's say, informal, uh, you know, volunteer collective projects. And, you know, the challenge is sort of making that material available and unlocking it um, so that it can be used by, you know, uh, downstream users of all types. Um, and that those are the kinds of mechanisms that I'm, I'm most interested in learning about from, from all of you today. Thank you, Chris.
Uh, that is a perfect segue in terms of subjects because Giovanna Fontanelle is the Program Officer for Culture and Heritage at the Wikimedia Foundation. Giovanna is a journalist and historian. She works as a Program Officer for, as I mentioned, the Wikimedia Foundation. In 2022 and 23, she was the General Coordinator of Creative Commons Brazil and is still a member of the Creative Commons Global Network. Her current work is more closely related to GLAM Wiki, Open GLAM, and linked open data initiatives, especially with museums, in addition to projects on diversity, mainly gender, and knowledge equity. Giovanna. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sissi, for inviting me today. It's always a pleasure to take part in um, conversations and presentations that you organize. Uh, well, I think, well, Christopher already talked very well about some of the Wikimedia aspects. I think, I believe today, uh, the questions that we are gonna answer and hopefully the discussion that we are gonna have, I will be able to bring some uh, Wikimedia perspective that comes together with what Christopher um, already talked a little bit. And actually, I think instead of repeating a little bit what he already explained very well, I would like to show an example, if that's okay. I was not planning to share a slide, but maybe this is this makes sense. It's just one slide. I think I, I told um, Jocelyn that I might do that. Um, if that's okay, I don't know. Um, let me see if I can do that, just so it helps. Um, yes, I can do it. Um, so one of the things that I believe that um, my answer to all the questions will be able to um, demonstrate is that like the real value of open is not really um, what we call what we what we understand by value. So like um, economic economical um, exchanges, but more about exposure and reuse on mass access platforms such as Wikipedia which increases the public's recognition and awareness of the institutions and its works, and which later is reflected by um, getting more people to know the institution and eventually visit the institution as well. And also achieving the mission of GLAMS with large scale educational and research uses, reaching new audiences and resources and potentially discovering gaps and new lines of, re of research that are previously unknown. Uh, and one of the things that we, can see very clearly uh, with open uh, um, big open access platforms such as Wikipedia is the the access aspect. So in this um, in this uh, graphic here that some of you might already have seen around, we can see a comparison between um, the number of page views in artworks that are that are from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So in red, you can see um, the number of visits that the specific artwork gets in the page of the um, artwork on the Matt's website. And then in light blue, um, the Wikipedia article uh, in English only. And then on dark blue, all the languages uh, on Wikipedia. So the impact is very strong and we can see that the value here is uh, it's it's about that um and so i think to understand this you know this type of um of in initiative it's also interesting to mention that in 2010 the british museum looked at the traffic of its own website versus the traffic of wikipedia the articles on wikipedia and they also found that there was um five times as much traffic to wikipedia as their own website and that thousands of images from their uh, collections were uh, missing from the wikipedia so from from wikipedia and so they started uh, uh initiative and the library of congress that uh had nearly uh 38 billion page views over the past decade and even like um outside of like this big institution a global north aspect uh, there was this museum in Brazil, the Museum of Veterinary Anatomy of the University of Sao Paulo, that had just like the, uh, the uh, most around 600 files that they uploaded. They had more than 7,000 page views just like in the one month of the initiative, right? 
And so, and this is like all of this data that I showed you and I'm stop sharing. Um, they are from uh, initiatives that have been happening for a few years. And for a few years now we have been, um, we have been um, working even more on image reuse, um, especially upgrading and enhancing Wikimedia Commons, which is our uh, media platform and revamping its media search. So this impact is to become even even greater, right? That's the that's the, the goal. So I would say that the value it's is this, but it's even growing more. So that's what I leave uh, for. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Giovanna. Our next panelist is Elliot Bledsoe. Elliot works uh, with the Australian Digital Alliance and the Australian Library and Archives Copyright Coalition on copyright advocacy, education, and reform activities. And additionally, he is also the co-lead of Creative Commons Australia and a member of the Committee of Wikimedia Australia as well. Elliot? Thank you, Connor. And uh, thank you, Brigitte and Jocelyn for the invitation to participate. Uh, a good early morning to everybody here in uh, Mianjin or Brisbane in Australia, where uh, it's only very recently gone into Thursday, the 29th of February. Uh, as, as has been mentioned, my name's Elliot, uh, and I wear many different hats that look at the kind of interaction or interplay between uh, copyright and creative practice and other types of cultural materials, such as cultural heritage. Uh, before I talk, I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yuggera people as the traditional custodians of the land where I'm presenting from today uh, and acknowledge their elders past and present and the important contributions that First Nations people make to art, culture and heritage uh, world round. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people who are participating today or who are watching back this video at some point in the future. Um, You've kind of heard a little bit about who I am and what I do, so I won't talk too much about that. But when I was initially asked to participate in the panel, I was like, uh, I kind of talk more on the copyright end of things. I'm not working in an institution. I'm not really sure what I can bring to a conversation about this. Um, but as I thought more about it, I became increasingly interested in this idea that perhaps the the way that we communicate the ask when asking people to make uh, or to pay a fee in order to gain uh, access to a digitized version of cultural heritage, that perhaps we're asking in the wrong way. So increasingly what I'm interested in is that uh, if the types of procedures and processes that cultural heritage institutions have in place are thought about and aligned with values and the mandate, the reason why an organization exists, uh, one of the first questions I would ask is whether monetization even is a value on which cultural heritage should be pinned. Uh, and that puts some fundamental tensions into the idea of uh, transactionally asking people to pay the human labor cost in order to gain access to uh, the material that they're interested in. Of course, that's not to downplay or, or underestimate the amount of time, effort, and money that goes into doing this. But what I'm interested in is what happens if you pivot the conversation in a different way. So for example, if the way that you communicate what you do as a cultural heritage institution and your commitment to access to your collection to the public, you can frame the way that you think about these things more as um, if you wanna get access to something, we strive to make as much of our collection available to the public in a digital format online as we can, bearing in mind that there are reasons why we can't make everything accessible, such as privacy or uh, you know, indigenous cultural intellectual property, other types of considerations. But if we take as a baseline that institutions want to make as much of their material accessible as possible, you can frame the idea of paying to get material digitized rather than being a transactional thing, being a way of jumping the queue, right? So we will get to this material at some point in the future. If that's not certain enough for you, you want the material uh, more expediously, you can 
make a financial contribution to bring that further up the, the production timeline so you get access to it, but also it becomes part of the publicly accessible collection. And what I'm interested in is if you reframe the communications line around that idea, does the amount of uh, individual paid digitization go up or go down as a result? I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'm interested in what an experiment with thinking about that looks like. Um, and in particular, because this is not a foreign idea, right? The development parts of larger institutions are going out to philanthropists and corporations that may have an interest in particular types of material in their collection and effectively asking them to do the same thing. Give us money to be able to make this material available and accessible to the public sooner than it might be if we rely solely on government sources of funding. So it's kind of more of a provocation that I'm putting out to this group. I'm interested to see what people think about an idea, whether anybody's uh, brave enough to flip the rhetoric and experiment with what a different type of approach to the ask might look like. So I'll leave it there for the moment, but I'm interested in seeing what people think about that idea. Thank you so much, Elliot. I'm sure, um, well, I for one and certainly the others would definitely like to answer that question and dive into that a bit. Um, but before we do, I'd like to introduce our last panelist or the fourth of the suite, Mr. Doug McCarthy. Doug is the head of the Library Learning Center at the Technical University of Delft. His research focuses on how digitized cultural heritage is made available for reuse. Since 2018, Doug was has led an international survey of open access in the cultural heritage sector with Dr. Andrea Wallace, known as the GLAM Open Access Survey, if I'm not mistaken. He is also the editor of the medium publication Open GLAM, which shares global perspectives on open access. Doug, over to you. Thanks, Connor. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining, and special thanks to the wonderful CC team for making this event happen and bringing a great panel and topic today. Um, yeah, as uh, my intro was said there that my background really is um, I'm an art historian by academic training and for the last 20 years I've been working with visual collections mostly in a variety of contexts. I have managed um, picture libraries, photographic studios, uh, filming and photography for national museums. I've also worked in commercial private image libraries doing licensing and rights management. I've also worked for private art collections in the past and now more recently in a uh, library context and also spent eight years working for Europeana, one of the biggest aggregators of digitized cultural heritage in the world. So the perspective that I bring to this topic and this area, I think hopefully comes from a variety of um, positions uh, given my experience. And what I'm really interested in right now is is thinking about how open content um, relates to the the purpose and mission of, for example, cultural institutions. You know, how does uh, copyright and licensing approach relate to what museums or libraries, for example, are trying to do overall, and how does digital collections you know, fit within that? So there is an aspect of strategy and mission, I think, which is an important kind of framing for this subject, and also. Um, I've been working and talking with institutions to understand what the barriers are. So I see that um, there's that great report from CC that's been linked in the chat already. Uh, thanks, Brigitte. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge those difficulties, which can be around policy, sometimes around technology, but also equally important to instill confidence and to support, let's say, uh, some of our peers who are working in those institutions um, around open. So that might be with sharing case studies, maybe uh, if like different models, positive examples that they can learn from, copy, remix, um, and also to do that often with relatable peers. So it's not always um, that helpful to be talking about, you know, the very wealthiest and largest museums in, uh, let's say, Europe or North America. I think small, medium institutions, which are most glams, let's remember, you know, are looking for something that's a bit different, that's more of a, something that they can relate to. And that also something that CC does so well is to 
provide kind of practical steps, policy guidance around how to start open, how to move forward with it, which is really, really welcome. And the last thing for me to say is very interested in business models around open, uh, whether that's online or on site, you know, physical model for your institution and the, the bigger context of all this. So the, the volume of visual content since I started my work in museums 20 years ago has you know, multiplied incredibly. So the policy approach for managing collections from 20 years ago is simply not fit for purpose for today's digital world. It's an extremely crowded marketplace, if you like, for museum content. And I think we need to work together to encourage institutions to really take a fresh perspective and have some inspiring ideas. I think that Elliot touched on also into what matters now and how can they respond uh, with their open policies and their content to, to be successful. So thanks. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, everyone. Um, all right. So I think the better position to start in is to unpack, unpack the context a bit more before we jump into solutions on how to solve these challenges. So my first question to everyone is if we could describe a bit together what um, the financial, commercial, and economic impacts of open access and cultural heritage are. Somebody would like to begin. Um, first thing I'd like to say about uh, on, on this is when you think about business models and open, um, there are a couple of very broad envelopes for me, one of which is financial. So numbers on a spreadsheet, things which are tangible, can be known, you know, can be reviewed profit, loss, costs, you know, and so on. That familiar person from finance who pops up now and then to uh, you know, demand uh, results and, and see what's happening. Okay, now in that area, um, I've been gathering and looking at data around uh, profit and loss, for example, for cultural institutions running licensing, attempting to monetize public domain content um, over the last decade or so. And there's a fair amount of useful data out there. We do need more um, that's been gathered from interviews, from freedom of information requests by a, a number of people, number of individuals. And the, the kind of headline here is that hardly any institutions actually turn a profit from that model. So the model of licensing content, you know, asserting copyright or using contract law to control and attempt to monetize digital collections was a bit more successful, slightly healthier 20 years ago when I started in this area. Um, that really isn't the case now. Very rarely will you see kind of uh, a number in the black rather than the red, you know, a profit being returned from the classic picture library model, if we can call it that today. So, you know, that being said, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why institutions really do need to take a fresh look at this practice, because that model from a couple of decades ago, from the analog era where remember transparencies, remember film, I certainly do, you know, just isn't working anymore and hasn't been for a while. So we really do need to have a, a fresh kind of spotlight on that. Now, if that's the general picture that we know from the data that we have, then, you know, one way to improve you like your bottom line, your financial position around uh, content licensing, content supply is, you know, start losing less money than you already are by changing your policy, right? So if you're losing 30, 50, some, I've seen over $100,000 in a two, three year period, then, well, like that should be concerning. That should be something you're seriously thinking about reforming. So there are a load of examples and positive examples using open access is one way to do that. So there's reallocation of staff who previously spent most of their weeks, days, often negotiating, uh, sometimes having heated discussions with typically academics, pretty much non-commercial users of public domain, let's say library, museum collections, and they're reallocated to much more positive and beneficial tasks for the institution overall, and also for those key allies, those audiences of researchers, academics, or historians, whether it's working on metadata, cataloging more content, working with marketing teams to get more content out there. There's a whole raft of creative things that picture librarians, that typical kind of role, you know, and it can and should be doing for institutions who are losing money with the same old model. And the other aspect with the financial realm is to explore new income streams. So these are 
numbers that can be seen on spreadsheets and generated from things like brand licensing, uh, licensed products, which could be in retail online or in museum shops, uh, things like print on demand, which are still, I think, popular. I, I have calendars and stuff that I get from museums still. And I also think there's room for innovation. I'd love to see more experimentation with things like pay what you like, you know, that you actually tap into people's potential kind of goodwill and good feeling towards your institution. It may be free at the point of principle, but people can donate and make, you know, micro payments, if you like, to support your institution in doing what it's doing. So I think overall, we need many more imaginative uh, approaches in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Chris, I saw your hand go up as well. Maybe you'd like to add some. I, I do. I have an illustrative point that connects to what Angie was saying before, because she sort of, um, you know, triggered in my mind uh, this great story that came out of uh, the qualitative research that we did. I'm going to share my screen because um, Giovanna has already um, broken the taboo on that. So let me just show it. Uh, hopefully you all can see this is from my, my course lectures today, actually, in class. Um, I was doing this case study with a local author um, in uh, Bristol named Eugene Byrne, and he um, told me that he was using the Internet Archive a lot uh, and that he had found this public domain book called The Annals of Bristol, which is by John Latimer from like the um, early 19th century. And he found it super useful as a local historian writing new publications about you know the history of Bristol. So he's drawing on this data, which is free and public domain and made available through the Internet Archive. And then he said, well, look, one day, a bunch of weird dressed people showed up at his door and they were dressed like steampunks. And they had used his books on the history of Bristol to then generate these science fictional imaginary new texts, which were, you know, kind of loosely based on the history of Bristol. But they were like, oh, you're, you know, we just wanted to come and say thank you so much because your book was really inspirational. And he turned them on to the Lat Latimer stuff. And so, you know, I think the concept that comes to mind, and I think where maybe Angie was going with her her description of what happened from, from her experience, is that there's a kind of an ecosystem, right? And there's these spillovers. And they have, you know, not just one layer, but they ha sometimes have multiple layers of downstream use, which gets unlocked through these, through the the availability of this of this content. So I just wanted to share that example because I think it's it's just one that for me maybe illustrates this this kind of ecosystem concept, which um, I think has some some uh, usefulness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the the famous quote for open access and open culture, which is everything builds on the past, right? So. There's definitely a lot, a lot to unpack there. Elliot, go ahead. Um, I think it's really interesting the points that Doug and Christopher have made, and and it might seem like a kind of uh, slightly tangential contribution to that. But one of the things that I'm really mindful of is that um, we get this kind of sense of moral outrage around threats to the public domain, and rightly so that's important. Yet in the same blush, we kind of uh, seemingly turn a blind eye to behaviours like asserting rights over a digitised version of public domain material or over using contract law as a way of uh, adding a set of kind of expectations or permissions around material that actually shouldn't have any sorts of uh, assertions placed over it. And I think this creates this interesting um, problem because largely this comes out of a kind of um, extractionist capitalist approach to copyright uh, that tells people that, you know, the value comes out of the fact that you can exclude others. And a lot of these models that we're talking about are kind of very much rooted in that kind of concept. And as Douglas said, particularly, I'm interested in these ideas of how you think about different ways of supporting or encouraging the exchange of value between, uh, you know, participants who are making productive reuse of the public domain and the sources from where they get it. Because I think there's a fundamental thing that we often forget about public domain and that increasingly as we move more and more into digital as the primary interface or access point for the public, that actually cultural collections 
are inherently linked to the public domain and actually often have the strongest set of motivations for preserving and digitizing and making accessible the public domain. And actually, we don't do a very good job at telling that story, but that's what people can get behind. That's what they're likely to put their own money up to support, right? Telling me I have to pay you to get a thing generally doesn't go down so well for a lot of people. Telling them that they're contributing to a bigger process of uh, making sure in my context, you know, important Australian cultural heritage is available for everyone to see, that's a very different ask. And I think that's kind of fundamental to why uh, there's so much red on the spreadsheet. Yeah, definitely very interesting. Do you want to, do you have a point to add there? Yes, and I, I think my point is a little bit brief because I think a lot of um, interesting aspects were already brought to the conversation, but I wanted to um, bring something else that connects a little bit. Um, so as like in my introduction, um, uh, you mentioned that I'm a journalist, so I, I of course always kind of bring um, conversations to like a communications <laughs> perspective. And uh, I think for your question, I would like to ask something back. Uh, so what like, um, does the, the sharing of cultural heritage images on social media, for example, cause negative financial, commercial and economic impacts for institutions? Um, I think I believe that in 2024, <laughs> most organizations right now understand that sharing their files on those closed uh, platforms don't bring their financials down, but actually help to improve it in other ways down the line. Uh, I know that, you know, uh, if you read um, research about the subject, uh, sometimes they do put um, interactions op with open access in different platforms in the same package of social media. And sometimes that is not always the best and it's not necessarily the same, but I think the the root of this question, that this question, this uh, kind of doubt about open access, um, it kind of dies out when you when you when you bring the social media perspective because organizations they do understand the benefits of uh, sharing their their files in those types of platforms uh, that you know awareness as I said before um, uh, this possibility of um, bringing new public different kind of publics to your organization research and all of that that is present in social media, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's even stronger and better and greater when you are using open access and you are uh, not only using social media, but also using platforms such as Wikipedia, in which all of that happens, but it has a way bigger uh, and further deeper um, impact that goes beyond just seeing the image on your screen, right? So I think that's kind of the, the one of the ways to answer this question is to answer something back, kind of challenging uh, the concept that we have of sharing, right? Why does like most of the organizations and people around this think about sharing on, uh, in platforms such as Instagram or Facebook and Twitter, and they, they're not thinking about the, the other types of platforms out there that could uh, eventually um, uh, offer like a, a even greater impact and awareness to their institution and their and their collections. Yeah, definitely. I think it's I think it is important on these on these issues to kind of speak a language that institutions can understand and the way that communications gets measured, you know, how many articles were there about the institution, how many times was the material featured in different places. That's a very clear way to say like it's not different. Um it's just you need a different language to describe how this how this is important and how it's um, how it's useful for the institutions. Um, Doug, why don't you jump in? Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really great point Giovanna made, and it's kind of weird if you think about it because institutions, whether they're open or they assert copyright for public domain collections, you know, basically have accepted the trade-offs of posting content on social media. You know, they've 
it's almost through necessity of trying to reach audiences. So basically, kind of said, okay, like these are the rules of the game that we are prepared to play. You know, so even if they claim copyright over something, they post it on Twitter, Facebook, Insta, or wherever, and they have accommodated with the, you know, between themselves that hey, well, we think that this is a net benefit, a net positive, and and worry less maybe about the negative kind of downstream effects. And what's odd about that, I think, is they don't sometimes don't apply the same kind of mentality or trade-off to to open content where you know you often you see museum leadership for example quite wedded to this thing about well you know, the economic paradigm as uh, Elliot touched on you know this very kind of financial spreadsheet approach to well this is all about income generation even though say they're often losing money trying to do that but that completely obscures the, all the positive downstream effects that I know Chris, for example, mentioned and has researched with colleagues where, you know, the, the surface area of opportunity is one way that I like to frame it, where open content online is incredibly powerful in the way that it hugely increases that surface area of visibility, exposure, and therefore opportunity for institutions. And using on, open content, I think, is a way to get there. You know, there are other ways, but that is one way. You know, people can't engage with your museum or library if they've never heard of you. They've never seen your content, for example. So you know, that, that's one of the things about the value of fame, that you know, you're going to get way more approaches and potential partnerships and offerings if people have heard of you. And, you know, open content is a way to really uh, accelerate and amplify your visibility online. And I think what's also missing is as uh, Giovanna mentioned, that like the opportunity cost of not being open. So I have, I promise it is, it is only one slide that I, I could share with you. And this is what it looks like. This is what, how potential allies, supporters and, and fans of museums feel like when they're confronted with non-open policies. So let me just share my screen for a couple of moments, uh, if I can find the right. <laughs> Little button in Zoom. Where are we? Oh yes. Go. Now. Hopefully you can see that. So I'm assuming you can. This is just a selection of responses to a tweet by Dr. Tess Macklin uh, out of the UK uh, last October, uh, talking about you know the frustrations of uh, non-open policies for. Uh, academics, researchers, historians, art historians, you know, those kind of communities. And these kind of tweets pop up pretty often on Twitter, once every couple of weeks, and it's a very familiar kind of stream of frustration, annoyance, irritation. Um, and, you know, hopefully you can make out some of these comments yourself, but this is what I mean about the real genuine opportunity costs of non-open policies. So people who are motivated to write about increase knowledge about, share um, in, in a variety of ways, your institution's collections, um, highlight them, help them reach new audiences, are exactly the sort of people that you should be helping out and working to ally and support with. And you know what we see in the familiar picture of non-open access using contracts or copyright law, you know, to prevent that it, with the aim of kind of controlling and monetizing content, usually unsuccessfully, is, this is the impact on real people, on their careers, on fields of research. is a massive distortion. I think we need to talk about the opportunity cost of non-open uh, a little bit more. And I will now stop sharing. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Um, Chris, do you want to touch on what you mentioned in the chat a bit? Yeah, and maybe it connects a bit with Doug's point too about, you know, trying to ask for extortionately high licensing fees for books, which let's face it, books are struggling at the moment too, right? Um, and then on the other hand, you have this sort of these new platform, you know, infrastructures. And and I didn't think we were going to get into talking about platform power today, but let's go for it. Um, you know, like the feed, the algorithmic feed on Instagram is so restrictive and so limited in its reach and and so ephemeral, right? Whereas like Wikimedia Commons is a searchable metadata rich, you know, permanent platform um, that, you know, who, that organizes the information according to totally different incentives, right? And 
So it's perhaps the only game in town if you're a you know marketing um, intern for a you know big uh, cultural heritage institution um, and you're posting things on social media. But but I think you know the 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 issue is that they're they're not going to have the impact and they're not going to hit the way that um, they might do on a platform that had different um, values in it in the way that it organized the information. So so this is just to say perhaps it might be in the interest of the cultural heritage sector to also give some thought to supporting and um, working together with the open infrastructures of sharing as 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 they already do with Wikipedia, but perhaps more so um, because of the clear benefits of that um, alignment of interests. Yeah, make a great point. And I think that's a good way to transition into this more solution oriented conversation. So what are some of the creative ways to share open collections that you've seen or that you might recommend that really go hand in hand with the open ethos? I know we've talked about um, Wikimedia Commons, but I'm sure we can also jump into a few more. Maybe Elliot, do you wanna start us off? Um, yeah, look, I have some thoughts in this area, but not particularly aligned to specific platforms or, or approaches, but rather, um, Going back to fundamental principles, uh, I think this idea of like the kind of, uh, you know, the opportunity costs lost from not being open becomes a really interesting paradox when you think about the shifting role of cultural heritage institutions in, uh, you know, in, in the public. And in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about here in Australia, particularly there's a, a, a strong context around this notion of decolonizing cultural collections and the need for uh, more decentralized, more pluralistic narratives around what uh, cultural heritage artifacts mean, both in terms of the historical context, what they mean in terms of the future, their kind of political, socio-political, economic, these different sorts of ideas require a range of voices uh, which have a wide range of different and disparate barriers already in place in terms of their ability to uh, you know, have a voice and be heard. But when one of the functional barriers that's in place is simply the uh, kind of shadow or quasi sense of ownership that a lot of cultural heritage collections have over their material, that is intrinsically in conflict with this idea of trying to be uh, you know, less of the authoritative vo voice around your cultural heritage material and more of a place for conversation uh, from a range of different voices. And I think because we've kind of, in some ways, at least in some functional parts of cultural heritage institutions, we've stripped away that principles-based mentality for other types of ideas such as, uh, you know, um, profit and loss spreadsheets, um, we've kind of set up this really problematic quandary. And I think, uh, I definitely think there are opportunities to thinking past it, but I think we need to start with the principle of why, what, what's wrong with what's happening now? Because we do know there's something wrong, but we need to understand the principles we want to be achieving and then start to look at solutions to meet that. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, hundred percent, Elliot. Um, and just to add to that, I think why where I always kind of start, I certainly recommend kind of friends and colleagues to begin with this is, you know, look at the institution where you're at and think, well, okay, what are the fundamental kind of values and mission and objectives that you have? Now they're going to be different. If you're in a an archive of 18th century Italian furniture, that's different from a 20th century military history museum, and is different from an art museum and is different from a medieval library you know, full of manuscripts. So there are naturally going to be audiences and different opportunities in your particular ecosystem that you say, okay, well, these are kind of key demographics, could be school groups, could be uh, you know, retired folks and so on. And that really is where I say, how can open practice align with and uh, you know, accelerate and hopefully improve and develop those goals, those objectives. So. Um, one of my favorite examples of open practice and this bigger picture thinking about what open can do 
is I think from 2019 was Cleveland Museum of Arts Open Program, where at launch they announced over a dozen different partners. Now, of course, being an art focused museum, those who are around platforms like Art Store, Artsy, there was they're also working with Creative Commons and Europeana, my former employer, but also with corporate partners like Microsoft, you know, to use open content to explore new technologies, new ways of understanding data and content. So it was a really rounded, and it's developed since, um, program of saying, well, these are the things that we want to do. This is our, these are our values and our mission for our audiences locally, you know, nationally, and also, of course, globally online. And what part can open play? You know, how can it be used as a kind of tool and accelerator for achieving those things? And I'll share a link now. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Giovanna, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so also touching what, with what Doug, Douglas and Elliot just said now, and previously a little bit, the, the, the previous response that we all gave, um, you know, I think one of the, of course, one of the biggest impacts is awareness, uh, visibility, of course, but this is like, um, to a certain ex extent. And then it gets interesting when we get to this question, which is like, what are the innovative ways in which we can interact with uh, the collections and how people can actually create meaningful um, interactions and actually to remember, <laughs> right? What they they saw, what they, what they read, right? Because this is also, uh, sorry, coming back a little bit to the, the previous answer, that's kind of the, the, the loss of social media that everything is so fast that you don't really pay attention it's not something that you with some exceptions of course but it's not something that you keep in your mind that much you just it keep scrolling and, and you know go back to you go to other content and i think the the, the meaningful ways in which we can interact is when we can actually make memories and um actually um make sure that people are remembering what with what they um, interact with so for example i would like to bring here some um some examples like for example a few years ago and i'm mentioning the metropolitan again i'm sorry <laughs> but it just it happened that it was the, the two um, examples that came to mind a few years ago they decided to do um an experiment in which they would put totems in um in the the actual museum in which people visitors could interact with um, um, files and their um, wikidata item in that totem and they could improve the descriptions of those files and the metadata connected to those files on wikidata but they would do that in person in in the museum um, further ahead uh, this is also a very good opportunity as I was saying before of making sure um, that people for, from different backgrounds and from underrepresented underrepresented groups can make can can uh, really make sure that the content that it is about them is reflected or is constructed in a very you know um, in, a, in a way that respects them right so it, it is putting people to actually um, uh, touch the, the the content, touch the the metadata, and um, create um, storytelling that it's you know beneficial and in accordance to what they believe or or that group believe, or or even if it's just like a kind of a technological aspect like this one of the mat, and this one from the mat, it was even like a few years ago, it also inspired an uh, initiative that I was involved with in Brazil, that it was the same thing. That they had like totems in the Paulista Museum in which people would, you know, um, do the same kind of activity. Uh, but it then like it, it involved some aspects of underrepresented culture as well, which was very aligned with the museum. And I think um, I think this aspect of like apps and games and um, that's the the you know the the kind of um, the kind of initiative that I like to see, that I would like to see more. Of course, that we need more resources to that to actually accomplish that. And in a lot of ways, this is also something that gets more difficult when you are talking about under-resourced places, like communities that are not in the global north. But 
Like, I think, um, yeah, I think I believe that this sort of initiative, it's what I would like to see more. And I think uh, that's the kind of the, the only way that we can do that actually in a, in a very in inclusive way is with open access. Yeah. Yeah, you make a lot of great points. I'm reminded of a, a presentation I saw recently about an about an archive in the UK um, that by making by by digitizing their collections, they could make the material more interactive because the archives the material they need to preserve in like a physical state. But by making books and so on open access, you can actually page through things that you wouldn't be able to interact with otherwise. And they had um, given examples of making those in a digital form in the in the archive, but also online. So it like it accelerates those possibilities and expands that uh, those modes of engagement that might not have existed before. Um, but there's still sort of this underlying question of how do these institutions maintain their their economics? What what are the real um, economic opportunities to expand services or to create um, a system that they can remain uh, yeah, sustainable? What do you guys think? Because there's definitely the, it, you know, making, making collections open access can provide opportunities for external actors to generate an income off of it. As Gio Giovanna was saying, you can have games producers and so on, but let's look a li little bit more on the institution. Go ahead, Elliot. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I, I just wanted to also make a comment on the previous discussion because I think um, I think it's a little bit even more difficult than we're um, fully acknowledging, right? We, we've been approaching it from the perspective of, okay, this is a this is a content licensing problem. But I think what Elliot's point raised and what the examples from Doug and Giovanna raised is that museums and cultural heritage institutions are undergoing a massive transformation in their um, footprint, in what they do, in the, the their identity, in the justification, and the way they rationalize their existence. And so the what OPEN contributes to that is one part, but they've got a whole bunch of fires going on at the same time. And it, you know, it occurs to me, like in in, in sort of examples, I, I sit across the hall from a project here at Glasgow called Museums in the Metaverse, and they want to digitally scan um, objects held in in museums and then make them available on a platform to make metaverse experiences, which is user generated user um, content, right? And of course, I think what's central to their issue is control, and. So the institution is relinquishing a certain amount of control when it comes to the economic potential of the object to be licensed in a you know economic way. But what they're really concerned about is the meaning, right? And the context and the perhaps the upstream um, collection from which it comes, where there's a heirs and there's a family with their own you know interests. And so all of that stuff is is in, in the same cauldron of, of of issues for the for the CHIs. Absolutely. Um, well, taking on Elliot's point, do we want to flip the rhetoric on how these institutions become funded? Do you think there's an opportunity really to take this conversation beyond the income outcome uh, binary and maybe really try to, you know, flip the rhetoric as he so eloquently put? Go ahead. Uh, thanks. I, I... I might expand on that idea because I think there's also this interesting uh, kind of problem that comes up for me that are cultural heritage institutions, even the right site, the right player, the right entity to make productive reuse of public domain material, right? The idea of the public domain is that actually becomes a resource for everybody to be able to make use of. And actually there are far better players, be they, uh, individuals or other types of entities who can reuse and repurpose public domain material and to give it a new productive life. Uh, are cultural institutions in the business of commercialising public domain or are they in the business of preserving, sharing and being custodian of cultural heritage? I think that's the kind of crux of the question. Um, I'm not convinced 
that many, if any, cultural heritage bodies are that good at running commercial enterprises that, uh, you know, prop themselves up using the public domain. Maybe that's a controversial thing to say, but I'm interested to know what others think. And if they're not, what can they do instead? Or how they can they be funded instead without that fear of control? Well, I guess to throw a really left field idea out there, what if, and I'm not saying we necessarily should be doing this, but in terms of thinking differently about these problems, what if, for example, cultural heritage institutions became, uh, you know, brokers, the access point to material and entered into arrangements where, uh, you know, 1% of commercial exploitation of public domain material was provided back as a revenue source to the host institution. Uh, you know, again, not necessarily endorsing that as an approach, but in terms of trying to think differently about it, if cultural heritage institutions aren't that great at doing it and other people are, if you remove the barrier, does that then stop the ability for money to move back to the cultural heritage institution? I saw a um, a proposal in a paper I was reading the other day. I've been reading a lot about generative AI and um, the copyright consequences and implications of that. And there was a proposal about that drew on this concept of the public domain payant, where you know you could um, exactly as Elliot suggests, or maybe slightly differently, um, you know, ex collect um, remuneration from. AI companies and others who made productive use uh, digitally of public domain materials, but collect that and then redistribute that to support art and culture um, in order to counteract the potential negative effects of art and culture being stultified by a flood of um, AI trained um, products. Um, so I think that there's certainly interesting um, parallel proposals for restructuring the payment system and the way that funds are reallocated. Um, I guess another uh, point I would make is that probably we would need robust economic evidence to convince the holders of the purse strings um, to um, provide meaningful compensation uh, to cultural heritage institutions if they're acting as sort of brokers or intermediaries. Um, but if I think if we could do that, and if we had um, you know political political will and uh, competence, I think um, you know that would be worth 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 experimenting with. Absolutely, I might challenge it a bit and say maybe it shouldn't be that we pay for the public domain, but we pay more for copyright. What do you guys think about that instead? That it's the copyrighted aspects that there's some kind of tax on, or maybe you have to pay for copyrights to copyright protection, and that goes to funding the public domain. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I'm a little bit wary or hesitant about this kind of framing because you know, even if we're talking about solely copyrighted content in, uh, let's say, a commercial uh, image library context, for example, you know, there are good data that shows that the the price per image, like the license fee per image, right, in that industry, at huge scale, is a fraction of what it was even 10 years ago. You know, first it was micro stock that annihilated uh, the, the, the previous model by massively expanding the supply side. You know, more recently, we've had user generated content, say last 10, 15 years, also inflating the, the sheer volume of products in the market. And of course, a little bit more recently, now we've seen generative AI, which is decimating, again, the, the kind of suppliers, the designers, artists, photographers, and, and you know, videographers, uh, probably very, very soon, you know, as, as we saw. So I just think that that framework, um, you know, the, the horse is bolted really on that model. I think I can hear it galloping in the far, far distance. And um, this is where I, I had a note of kind of pragmatism around this that I'm, I, I'm a bit hesitant or skeptical about um, seeking to find remuneration as just described from even copyrighted content, I think is, is going to be difficult. So at some level, 
Uh, I think cultural institutions need to kind of accept that deep down and then look for other forms of value. So just to give you one example, um, in the UK, in the, the centre of England, Birmingham Museums Trust, up until 2018, were a copyright asserting over public domain, you know, closed access institution, pretty typical of, of the UK in that respect. They went open access. Now, they're not a national, they had pretty limited funding from, uh, they were from the local council, then they became an independent trust with a new director and essentially one or two people inside decided to pursue open access using CC0 from 2018 onwards. Now, the previous financial year, they lost £12,000 pursuing the old broken model. And they estimated in their press team that the first full year of open access, they had equivalent, they had publicity, so local, national press, broadcast media, and so forth, worth, 100, worth over £100,000 generated from going open access and you know, freeing up and enabling through a good news story, um, content and profile of their museum. So I think those are the kind of value areas that we should be thinking about um, in this discussion. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. It's definitely not a, not a silver bullet kind of conversation. There's not going to be one thing that kind of solves the, the larger puzzle, but it's a mix of things that need to kind of come together. Giovanna, go ahead. Yeah, I would say um, a few things because I think, well, the the moment that the the idea here was being shared, I was like, oh, this is really interesting, and I really want to read that article, Christopher, if you can share it, so I can try to understand a little bit more. Um, but I think I am also a bit hesitant, as though it is because, um, of course, that I'm all about you know, uh, charging from big AIs. Like I think this is something that you know, we, we, we should see more, um, especially right now when it is all starting. Um, but I do worry about how that specifically, I, this specific idea could progress and develop. Um, it's fine right now if it's all about how we charge uh, this big AIs, but like when I could imagine this um, progressing in a way that would not be uh, very beneficial for the open access culture, right? And especially public domain, which is the main idea is that it should be always available for everyone. This is, you know, it is now public good, right? Um, but I like, I just keep imagining like maybe, <laughs> for example, if we, yeah, it could eventually turn out that like, it's not only about the big AIs, but it's like, if you put like a, your image in a book, maybe you wanna share the, the <laughs> The, the money that you make from that book with and that doesn't make sense and the same with like for example youtube for example if you use a public domain image on your video uh would that um, amount uh be from youtube itself or would it be from like the creator doing the video right and it doesn't really like right now at least the way that i'm thinking i couldn't really I mean, with Wikipedia, like, should we share, you know, part of our uh, donations because, like, people are using the public domain images that we like? I, it's just that I, I'm trying to understand a little bit more, but I think I, I would like to read more about it. That's what I'm saying because I, the way that I'm thinking right now, I'm not sure if I, yeah. But it's really like it's really food for thought. Like, it's really interesting to challenging to challenge those ideas and to bring new perspectives and new ways of interacting with it. Um, yeah. I I think those are really interesting um, sort of counterpoints to this sort of you know generic proposal. I mean, there are many proposals on how to deal with um, you know having a free and open public domain, um, and then having commercial users and non-commercial users whether or how to differentiate between them, um, and then whether it's appropriate to you know ask for compensation from commercial use, how to you know make that happen. I think that the these types of proposals are driven by anxiety in uh, creative industries as much as in holders um, of of large repositories of public domain or copyright material um, over the sheer scale of the transformation that's that's likely to happen with generative AI. Um, so that it is provoking these kinds of questions and conversations. But I think that's absolutely a great point, Giovanna. That if we start to um, 
if we start to charge or we start to identify uses, it's a slippery slope that then we, it takes us back to licensing again for everything. Yeah. Thank you both. Elliot, go ahead. And then after that, we'll hand over to the questions. Um, I guess uh, kind of extending from that idea, uh, it's worth remembering, of course, that nobody is precluded from commercializing the public domain. Right? That's actually a fundamental principle of the public domain. So that doesn't stop any individual user, that doesn't stop any corporation, that doesn't stop any cultural heritage institution, right? So when these other types of barriers are put in place, we've got to ask questions about those motivations uh, because they are counter to the principle of what the public domain is about. So uh, when I talk about this idea that, uh, you know, is there a way where say commercialized use of the public domain has a kind of trickle back effect, that's got to be something that's done, uh, you know, or where the motivation is coming from the user of the public domain material. I certainly would not uh, endorse or support a model that, uh, you know, forces a, a kind of payment method into the public domain. But uh, I think, you know, they're interesting and important questions to be unpacking because, uh, you know, there's a lot of cost that goes into actually preserving and making accessible the public domain. and. Uh, you know, how and where does that value kind of sit in the ecosystem? But uh, I think it's good to hear some thoughts from other participants. All right, thank you everyone so far. I am going to hand it over to our audience. Perhaps somebody would like to raise their hand. Oh, there we go. Sebastian, why don't you share your question? Yes, hi everyone. Thank you for the wonderful discussion, really, I think absolutely on point and, and topical. And I would just like to pose like a kind of um, provocative question in, in a different aspect of maximizing the value of open access, because I, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, um, there is a disconnect between um, some of the lobbying efforts that are going on to uh, get allies, you know, to get cultural heritage institutions to voluntarily uh, put things in the public domain, um, and certain things that have already been achieved, like in the EU, the uh, Article 14 of the Copyright uh, Directive, which frees visual works from reproduction rights, but which is often ignored. So I always was thinking, you know, so I have a I'm one of these people that really use collections. And for example, you have image banks by image archives um, in, in Germany. They will just leave the copyright sign, right? They just don't care about it, even though by law it should be public domain now. But what does that mean, you know, which reproduction and with which image fees can they still get through? So do we need maybe like analog to we are sometimes people that we are sometimes bothered by when we re try to reuse public domain data, copyright trolls, right, which falsely assert copyright claims on platforms like YouTube, also like good faith public domain trolls, like actual organizations go around and maybe, um, you know, uh, not instantly litigate when somebody falsely claims reproduction rights or put copyrights on the public domain, but maybe does freedom of information requests because many of these institutions, as I get them, as I get a sense are public institutions that uh, have, you know, rely on statutes or rely on law and they always fall back was, oh, we got to respect the local law of, you know, how reproductions uh, are produced. And it seems to me that in some places to really open up the value of uh, open access materials that are not de declared as such, there must, should be people, I don't know if it could be the Wikimedia Foundation or Creative Commons itself that goes around and actually checks and, you know, <laughs> uh, pokes a stick at, you know, some of the false labels that are, that are out there. And I just wanted to throw that out there and what you think of the idea or alternative ideas of how you would, you know, uh, enforce public domain rights that have been achieved in law already. Thank you. I'm already loving the idea of the public domain police force, but Doug, I'll hand it over to you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, me too. Hi, Sebastian. Great to see you. Um, yeah. My, my comment here is that, you know, much as maybe we, some of us might like 
um, copyright to be kind of uh, that decisive, if you like, in this conversation. You know, it it isn't in the fact that actually the UK is a brilliant example right now, following a recent judgment in the Court of Appeal, which he, J versus Sheridan, um, which I wrote about. You know, many British institutions are already and are going to start removing those little copyright symbols. You know, which you know, naughty institutions should have really removed at least ten years ago. Anyway. But they've also said at the same time, well, you know, OK, that's changing, but we're going to continue to control and attempt to monetize and you know, limit access to the public domain using contract law. So, you know, copyright is one thing, but contract law is a layer that they can continue to apply to essentially preserve the status quo, uh, keep their position the same. Um, so that I say, say that with a little bit of sadness. And I know there are lawyers in this call who actually know way more about this than I do. But I also agree, Sebastian, with your first point that compliance, if you like, around copyright, say post Article 14, which is flawed, uh, you know, flawed uh, drafting of that directive, but is is very weak, is super soft, and you know maybe our kind of public domain police, friendly police, uh, could be useful to to nudge institutions in the right direction regarding copyright policy, if not contract law. So thanks. Thank you, George Elliot. I'll just add one quick thing, uh, which is uh, basically the kind of position I take, certainly here in Australia, is that if you have confidence that materials in the public domain, who gives a shit what the cultural collection puts on their website, right? As long as you are confident that it is in the public domain, treat it as if it's in the public domain, right? That doesn't answer questions in terms of being able to access material that, say, hasn't been digitised or put online. But if it's online and they're claiming it's copyright and it's not, you're not going to change things by giving in to the rhetoric that they use. So that's a bit of play by your own rules or play by the better rules kind of thing. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah, just just briefly, maybe to give the good cop, bad cop <laughs> alternative view. I mean, I, I think that there's the, the um, Sebastian um, raises an important issue, which is that this isn't just about um, institutions because many of these institutions are public and it's also about uh, states, right? And, and, and law, national lawmakers. Um, and so I think that the, the, the changes would be most effective if they're supported um, by, by, by the states and by, and by uh, you know, national law. I think we saw that with orphan works, right? Where, um, you know, getting the getting the law right such that it maximizes the you know ability of uh, cultural institutions to unlock these digital contents took a while, and took a lot of um, sort of lawmaking uh, in order to kind of kind of make that possible. Uh, so, so I would say um, you know that that's another place where lobbying and where you know um, research and the actions and activities of Creative Commons might also be directed. Um, you know, not only with institutions, but also at, at national law. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Um, Angie, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, my apologies for interrupting. I, I didn't realize. I'm going to put an article uh, into the chat that kind of, it's called Forgotten Blues, and it talks about all of the things that were a domino effect of the result of this website that we started in 2004, before many of the libraries were even digitizing things. Um, I want to share my story that I personally have not been paid to, to archive all of this material. Um, at that time, we thought it was very important for the world to know about these musicians. Um, I have not been paid for my work advocating for this. Um, but people after me have, have benefited monetarily. Um, I will put the article in there. Um, I think that the work that we did was was really groundbreaking in a way. And I think it's something that would be important to look at. Um, another concern is that 
you won't find my work, my name on Wikipedia much. I don't even think that I'm on Wikipedia. Um, that concerns me um, because the work was very substantial, as you'll see. Um, so I'm very interested in equity, um, especially for um, certain types of, of people. Um, that they are recognized for their works as well. As far as the monetary thing, uh, I would suggest maybe awards. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angie. I'm glad we got to your point, and I'm very much looking forward to check out the Forgotten Blues excerpts. Would anyone like to add something about the idea of awards maybe being a direction of something for monetization? I know that, for example, Europeana does an annual Jiff It Up campaign where there's always a first prize and second prize and so on. I'm sure there's other examples of that that maybe one of you has a reference to. Well, just to say that, you know, there's a, there was a model for this sort of in the adjacent um, open science uh, world. If you recall, 10 or 15 years ago, the popular platform was called Zooniverse. It was a crowdsourcing platform where sort of citizen scientists could do the tedious work of processing data <laughs> for the scientific principal investigators and cosmology and biology and cells and things like that. Um, and I think it was like, on one hand, it, it kind of, it's a PR exercise, right? Cause it kind of opens, you know, an inaccessible scientific endeavor to everybody and it creates, you know, a lines of communication. Um, and there were some, you know, it wasn't monetary awards or prizes but there were some, you know, I think notable and uh, as reported in the press, instances where individuals uh, had, you know, located a new star or, you know, something like that. And so, you know, I think those kinds of initiatives um, where you invite the public um, to co-create uh, using public domain uh, materials is our, and I think Giovanna described some sound really fascinating ones, um, possibly, a, you know, a really important innovation if done, if done well. The Zooniverse was criticized because it was sort of like, two tiers, right? There's the PI and then there's the, <laughs> the people just doing the grunt work. So that was the um, the, the, the criticism, but I think it, there was a lot of potential benefit there too. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, um, from my side, thank you, uh, Elliot. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you, Doug. Over to you, Brigitte. Yeah, from me as well. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I think you really shared important insights into the, the very real economic issues that um, might arise in the context of open culture. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your questions that really brought a lot of richness to the debate. New issues were raised that we hadn't thought about. So really grateful that this could be made part of the conversation. Um, I can't resist the um, uh, to sh yeah, the the need to share some of my key takeaways from from this. I've been scribbling notes uh, throughout, so um, and uh, if you don't indulge me, I just want to share a few things. Um, one key takeaway for me is that it's often not all or nothing; that it's a false binary to think that there's free and there's paying, and that we need to look at new perspectives that kind of shake that false dichotomy, and that there might be some models that are in between or that really try to challenge that the fact that um, it's either paying or you know you just give it away for free and then have um, have absolutely no way to recoup your investment. Um, I really like also the concept that it's all part of a much larger ecosystem than institution and individual user, right? There are a lot many a lot many more players that um, that partake in this uh, system, and so the positive spillovers might not be immediately evident uh, when we look at that tra very transactional relationship, but they might be more indirect, and eventually they link back, even though they might not be a direct transfer um, of money in the first place. Um, I also really like the fact that there's a, a need to reframe the why. So if institutions are asking for payment, 
um, there's an opportunity to kind of uh, re reframe why that payment might be needed. And that might help and encourage people to go into a pay as you can model if they are willing to support something that has a grander, um, like more elevated um, goal for in their view. Um, what else? Um, I think the visibility, the outreach, the new interactions with the collections, the notion of inclusive engagement, respectful engagement, and really at the at the base of it all, equity also surfaced in quite many um, questions and comments. So I think it's important that we highlight that too. Um, and that the institutions are really going through this massive transformation and equity is one of the key um, emerging issues that is really questioning their raison d'etre and, and, and challenging it with, with all sorts of new tensions. Um, what else? Um, I think I will end on one last thing and it's the, the question of the opportunity cost uh, because often uh, institutions will see potential for gain, but they will forget to look at their huge risk of not opening up and what they lose there is often very hard to quantify until they have, uh, you know, dipped one toe into the open culture pool. Um, and so that impact and influence is lost uh, if the collections don't reach the one or many people that might have a very unique and important interaction. So. I wanted to share those um, those key thoughts before leaving you. Um, thank you, Connor, for your expert moderation. That was uh, very well done. Uh, you'll be editing and posting this video. So for those of you watching in the future, um, thanks so much for, for taking the time to watch this. We have more webinars uh, coming up on various topics. So watch out for uh, upcoming announcements. And that's goodbye for me now. Thank you again so much for being here today. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye. Bye.